President Biden called the vote a blatant act of partisanship. It is the first time in nearly 150 years a cabinet secretary has been impeached. Meantime, the majority for House Republicans just got even slimmer. Democrat Tom Suozzi won last night's special election for the seat left open by George Santos. He had previously represented his district in Congress for three terms. Pope Francis says that laziness is a very dangerous temptation. During his weekly talk at the Vatican, the Holy Father said its roots are in a lack of care. And to defeat sloth or boredom, we must lean on Jesus, who will always take us away from temptation. I'm Tracy Sable with EWTN News Nightly. Follow us on Facebook and X and join us this evening. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Mitch Pacwa. In North America, call toll free 1 833 288 EWTN. That's 1 833 288 3986. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985 or send an email to openline at ewtn.com. Good afternoon. So glad to be with you this fine Ash Wednesday. Um, I know it's something of a disappointment that St. Valentine's Day is preempted by Ash Wednesday, but that's the way the liturgical ball bounces. <laughs> now, it's easy for me to say since I haven't had a date in almost 56 years, so <laughs> it's not meant a whole lot to me for a long time, but uh, that is the case, and we do uh, recall this as a day of uh, remembering our mortality. That's the uh, key things. So this is something that we want to um, celebrate and begin a very good Lenten season. And of course, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, our phone number is one 288 ewtn Well, that's in numbers. It's 833-288-3986. Outside the United States, outside North America, you can call country code 1, area code 205-271-2985, or email us at, by writing to openline at ewtn.com. Now, let's take a look at a couple of these uh, emails that you have sent before we get to our phone calls. Uh, first of all, um, I've been told by my husband, who's also Catholic, that he wants me to remove some of the statues and religious pictures from our house because it makes him feel uncomfortable. I can't fathom feeling uncomfortable surrounded by holy images because for me it gives me a sense of peace and comfort as I'm going through a very emotional situation with family right now. I'm really at a loss as to what I should do. I feel that by taking down any of them, I would be disrespectful as they are all blessed and many were gifts given to me. In addition, it caused me extreme sadness because no matter what room I am in when praying, I can focus better on the prayers I'm saying. Any advice would be appreciated. Blessings, Michelle in Syracuse, Nueva York. Uh, Michelle, first of all, th this sounds as... Uh, at the outset, as if you and your husband are not communicating at deep enough level on this. Uh, it's obviously something that is very important to you, but it also causes him distress. And one, I'm not recommending that you get into an argument with your husband. I, as a matter of fact, I don't think that is a good idea, uh, given the topic, but also given the importance for your marriage. However, uh, I do think that you should discuss these issues with him. That's a very important point. You know, ask him to um, explain his discomfort. And 
uh, I'm going to say this too at the outset, just from having dealt with lots of people over the years. You don't want to say, um, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Uh, discussions between spouses don't improve by judging one another. That doesn't make them better. Well, you shouldn't do this. And, and telling people what they should or should not feel does not help the conversation at all. And I think it would be better to listen and let him know that you're really trying to hear what his reasons are. And if he gives his reason, you don't have to come up with a response right away. You don't say, well, that doesn't count because, no. Say, I want to listen to this and find out what's going on. There could be a number of, of issues uh, in within him that you need to pay attention to that is more than just the statues. I'm going to... I'm actually going to guess that it's more than that. It's something besides the presence of holy images around your house. Something else is bothering him. And you would do well to find out just as he, uh, then when you get a chance, tell him how you uh, experience this, what What are some of the feelings going on in you? Try to listen respectfully, but also speak to him with uh, and um, say, this is how I feel. And I always like to point this out to married couples and other people, too. If you can make a statement and say, logically say, in front of it, um, I think, bang, 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 then you are most likely giving a judgment on the person. Uh, you, If it sounds like I feel, and see, people use the word I feel to mean I think very often. I really feel that you're being very stupid. Um, <laughs> that's not a feeling. That is a judgment. But if you say, I feel angry that you want to take down these holy images or uh, whatever, that, uh, that, you know, you don't, you can't say, I think angry. It doesn't make sense. You're giving your own feelings or I feel sad. You can't say, I think sad. You're talking about what's happening inside of you. Share at that level so that you can help each other find what's going on. Because I, I guarantee it, there's, there's much more uh, than that happening there, and I recommend that you pursue that with him. Okay? Let me now go over to Joan, um, who says, uh, regarding Lat- Lenten ashes, the... Palms from Palm Sunday are blessed and burned to make the ashes for Ash Wednesday. They are blessed again before being placed on the forehead. Why is it that we then wash our faces and and the blessed ashes go down the drain or the ashes might be wiped off with a tissue and tossed into the trash? Lord, anything blessed should not go down the drain or be put into the ch- trash. Well, with something like blessed ashes, I don't know uh, many ways what you if, if this is something that would bother you, what you can do is get a wash basin and wash your wash the, off the ashes in a basin or a dish and then put that out in the ground. However, um, given modern uh, water systems, uh, I've never heard uh, anybody... Uh, recommend that you have to wash the ashes off into a basin or something. Uh, You may do that, but I've never heard that there was a necessity with them. Um, I I think it's just part of the practicality that it's hard to wash off ashes without it going down a drain. Um, 
And so uh, you, yeah, it's not that you're trying to put something blessed on the drain, but part of the purpose of the ashes is to remind ourselves ashes to ashes. Remember, men, that you are dust, and unto dust you shall return, uh, as, as the prayer goes. So that may not be a bad thing. And then also, just real shortly, um, I've been struggling with the question whether or not I should attend a good friend's son's wedding. The son uh, is Catholic. The bride is Orthodox Coptic. We recently found out that the groom had to get anointed by the bride's pastor in order for them to marry in her church. My husband does not want to attend the wedding or reception because he believes the groom has renounced his Catholic faith by being anointed in the Orthodox Church. I attempted to research this issue, but haven't been able to find a definitive answer. Um, I would find out from the young man, talk to him, have you renounced your Catholic faith? So don't guess. You know, this is, sounds like a day we have to talk about communications here. But don't guess as to whether or not he's renounced his faith. Ask him. It may not be that he has renounced the, his faith, and it may not be what the Coptic Orthodox priest has asked him to do. Um, find that out. Uh, I've not come across this situation either. So um, it, it's one of those things that we have to deal with. But I have to deal with the, the end of this segment. Hard break coming. Be back in just a minute or two. Please stay with us. EWTN Radio is seeking a dynamic radio producer to join the EWTN Radio team in Irondale, Alabama. The right candidate will be a passionate, multi-skilled, talented professional who can manage and direct all aspects of producing world-class radio broadcasts and play an integral part in Mother Angelica's mission. If this is you or someone you know, email a resume and cover letter including salary requirements to humanresources at EWTN.com. This is Tracy Sable from EWTN News Nightly. EWTN Radio brings you live and complete coverage of special events that affect your life. I'm a D.C. native. I grew up in Northern Virginia. I'm actually a convert, so when I was in high school, I was pro-choice, and it wasn't until I had a tough conversation with one of my friends that I became vastly and amazingly pro-life. I mean, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be a witness to life and the beauty and sanctity of that. I'm grateful that we can all be out here today. When I found out I was pregnant, um, they told me, because I was high-risk pregnancy, they told me that I can consider getting an abortion, and that's when I said, definitely not. That's not going to happen because I think this is a blessing from God. I'm blessed now. Look at my babies. This is my blessings forever. I am a mom forever, and I am so blessed to be a mom. Your pro-life network is EWTN Radio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Okay, welcome back. We are... uh, Pretty full uh, lines right now, but as uh, things open up, we'll be happy to hear from you, too. Let us first go to Douglas in Kenner, Louisiana, right next to the airport in New Orleans. How are you, Douglas? Oh, just fine, Father. It's um, good to get to talk to you. Thank you. I was um, I was talking with an, um, an evangelical this morning. Uh-huh. And we were talking about, you know, the merits or, or maybe not of Mardi Gras. And then the conversation switched, and I was making the point that well, plenty of times evangelicals think that we're um, worshiping saints because we pray to saints. We pray for their intercession. Mm-hmm. But what we never do is offer sacrifice to saints. That's the point that Dr. Andrews makes all the, all the time. The, the, what about, now, what was that about sacrifice again? But we would never make a sacrifice to saints. No, so of course not. And so we're not 
you know, we're not worshiping them no, by, no, no. by praying to them. And right. um, and I was saying, that, but the reason why evangelicals think that we're wor- worshiping them is because your form of worship is singing and preaching, and because of that. Mm-hmm. But that's not really a sacrifice. You don't have sacrifices mm-hmm. in your liturgies. And then it was amazing that he could come up with this um, just. It could, right away on the spot, he brings out this little T90 microscopic Bible, and he goes to um to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, putting on my glasses here, where it says, it's just this one line, which is, you know, mm-hmm. often evangelicals will do that, just one line without the context. Through him then, and they're talking of Christ, through him then, um, let us continually offer God a sacrifice of praise. That is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And I did mm-hmm. notice that his little T.N.I.C. Bible said, the fruit of our lips. Mm-hmm. So into his mind, you know, we're, um, well, no, we are offering the sacrifice by praising, you know, the name of God. So I feel like I lost that, that point. <laughs> so I just want to know what your thoughts are. Okay, a couple. Uh, uh, first of all, let me just get that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, the word "our" is not in there um, in, in in the Greek text. It's just a fruit of lips. First of all, that passage, Hebrews thirteen verse fifteen, is quoting Psalm a hundred and seven. And uh, which says, let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. So that uh, that's Psalm 107, verse 22. And also in Psalm 116, verse 17, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. So this is something that... Uh, it is there uh, in the Old Testament, and it is one kind of sacrifice. That's true, but that uh, so we, of course, we believe what it says here in Hebrews thirteen verse fifteen, and we pray the Psalms every day. These these and other Psalms, and offering of. Our uh, the the fruit of our lips, offering you know our praise as a sacrifice, is what we do. So that's, for instance, why at mass. Well, not right. We don't say this not in the Roman rite until Easter. But the uh, glory to God in the highest. We um, we are offering praise to God uh, throughout mass. We offer a sacrifice of praise to God. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. Um, And so many of the other prayers are prayers of praise and adoration. That is part of our sacrifice. But just as in the Old Testament, where the Psalms, which were the liturgy of the temple, where they say that you are, offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and songs of joy. Um, well, that is part of the temple liturgy. So also did they offer the sacrifices of animals. So they offered praise and blood sacrifices. We do the same, that we offer a a sacrifice. Uh, well, we offer incense, um, and uh, that's also one of the sacrifices that goes back from the Old Testament all the way to the end of the book of, uh, you know, all the through the book of um, Revelation. And so, offering uh, sacrifice uh, is a, 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 a good thing with praise, but also we offer the sacrifice, not of animals, because we recognize that the blood of the bulls and goats and sheep and the lambs were prefiguring 
the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Jesus, our Lord, is sacrificed on Calvary. And it's, it's the Bible, the New Testament, calls his death a sacrifice. And so, but it's not something that we offered just, you know, he just happened, and then it, we're just observers. We also continue to offer the sacrifice of his body and blood at Mass, along with our praise. And we mix, just as in the temple in Jerusalem, they mixed offering of praise with the animal sacrifices. We offer praise and we offer the, the sacrifice of Christ. And this is typical of the difference between many non-Catholics and Catholicism. Many non-Catholics see this as an either this or that. Uh, that's, that's how it often is. So they'll say it's either scripture or tradition. It's either all grace or it's your free will. We say, no, it is both and. So is scripture and tradition. It is a sacrifice of praise and the unbloody sacrifice of Calvary. Both of those are true, and that's what, why we maintain that fullness of the faith. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, that really explains a lot. It, you know, and so I think my evangelical friend has definitely made his point that praising is a, is a form of sacrifice. Yes. I guess I would, well, would, would be wanting to ask him, like, yeah. well, what okay. is being, like, so you offered this, so, so what is being, um, like, what is being killed? What is the oblation? I guess it's just that it's such a different use of the word sacrifice. That right, right. And it's, it's just using this, uh, that word, uh, uh, you know, offering that sacrifice up, uh, it, it's uh, by analogy, but it's a good analogy. As a matter of fact, let me just check. Um, yeah, they just use the word zavach, so it just means sacrifice, and it's by analogy. It's just not killing somebody. Though I've been in a few places where people singing in the pews um, – are killing me. Uh, that's another problem, though. <laughs> so um, it, it's just it's just what you offer to God, and you know, praise God that they do it. But we also offer the holy, the body and blood of Christ, His soul and divinity. Thank you, Douglas. Let me go over to Joel in the Republic of Texas, right there in San Antonio. Joel, what's up? Hello, Father Mitch Pacwell. Hello. Hi, what's up? What can we do for you? Are you familiar with the blue scapular attached to the five-fold scapular? No, not really. I, I, I've seen people have it, but I'm just not very familiar with it. You know, I got the brown scapular when I was eight, and that's the one I know best. Well, I have the brown scapular. I, I also have the um, mm -hmm. blue scapular, which is sure. attached to the five-fold scapular. So my uh, question is, well, the, the blessing and investment of the scapular, mm -hmm. of the blue scapular, was approved in 1671. Right. Back, right. Back then. And these indulgences are pretty old. There are supposed to be... 433 plenary indulgences mm -hmm. besides the temporal, which are right. innumerable. Right. And what I found is um, you one is uh, supposed to pray six Our Fathers, six Hail Marys, and six Glory Bees in honor of the Most Holy Trinity mm -hmm. and in honor of the Immaculate Mary, and mm -hmm. also um, the... Necessities of the sacraments are not necessary. Now, in today's time, with the rules of indulgences, how can one live by it and practices, practice this out daily? Um, well, well, I would have—here's one of the things about the indulgences, is that 
when, for instance, you have that responsibility to pray in honor of the Blessed Trinity and the Immaculate Virgin Mary, right? And the prayers themselves have great effectiveness. The Lord's Prayer, of course, Hail Mary come from Scripture, and then giving an offering of praise to God, with the glory be to the Father. So all, uh, Son and Holy Spirit. So those are good prayers. In terms of the uh, indulgences, you know, uh, while we don't uh, speak of the days of indulgence because those were actually days of indulgence off of one's uh, penance in confession. But we do talk about partial indulgence as well as plenary. And to see that uh, we can get a plenary indulgence once a day, uh, that's, that's the norm there. And then to uh, trust our Lord uh, and his merits and his graces to give us the other indulgences. And then I leave it in God's hands. I don't overly worry about that because the focus I want to make when wearing the scapular is I am putting on the yoke of Christ. That's what the scapular is meant to symbolize, putting on the yoke of Christ. And by doing that, I am entrusting myself to him and walking alongside him uh, in his pathway of, of eternal life. And that's where I just, Lord, I just trust in you and leave it to his providence. All right, we'll be back with more questions from Marcus, Joseph, Joey, and Tara. So please stay with us. The month of February is devoted to honoring the Holy Family. It's a reminder for us to strengthen our own family life. Mary and Joseph serve as the perfect model for every mother and father and setting an example for children on how to live a Christ-like life. Join in this devotion to the Holy Family with novenas, prayers, art, books, gifts, rosaries and chaplets, statues and nativity sets available at EWTNRC.com. This is Bishop Andrew Cousins, Chair of the National Eucharistic Revival with this month's Eucharistic Moment. The woman of Samaria met Jesus at the well and she was changed. She ran back to the town and exclaimed, come and see the man I've met, the Messiah. When she encountered Jesus, she was compelled to share his love. Our reception of the Eucharist, Jesus Christ who is love, should compel us with the same missionary fire. When we realize how much we have been loved, when I realize what a treasure it is to know him and to be called to union with him, I want the whole world to experience this. Many are afraid to become missionaries, but they don't realize it's as simple as talking about what we love and inviting others to experience him. When you encounter him in Holy Communion, ask him for the grace to become his missionary. Do you have an important prayer need? We'll pray with you tomorrow on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. On most of these EWTN stations. Now back to Open Line with Father Mitch Pacwa. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. All right. First of all, I just want to mention that tonight on EWTN Live at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, of course, you have to adapt that to your own time zone, but at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Francis Meyer is going to be discussing his recent uh, interviews. It's a survey of interviews of various bishops, priests, deacons, religious, lay people, uh, and immigrants um, uh, 
to get a very frank understanding of what's happening in the church today. And it's a very sobering picture of the American church at the present moment. But it also gives a lot of hope. It, it, it points out that the church is in better shape than the media would have us think. So there's really a lot of hope for the future here, and that will be a uh, good interview. He's, he's a good man. I was able to talk to him already and look forward to this interview. So tune in today. Let us now go over to Marcus in Columbus, Ohio. Marcus, what's up? Hi, Father. Blessed Lent to you. And so, to you, too. Thank you very much. So I recently heard um, that Melkites are permitted, or rather not permitted, but that they do only accept as infallibly authoritative the first seven ecumenical councils. And that hmm. seems to me to be clearly incorrect, but in doing some brief research to try and find out that that's not true, I encountered some limited evidence to suggest that it actually might be true. So I wanted to see if, what you had to yeah, say about I, that. You know, uh, I have never heard that, and I don't, I don't have a, 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 the opportunity to research that right now. I will—there's uh, a Melkite parish—by uh, the way, for those who are unaware, the Melkite Catholic Church are uh, Byzantine Catholics who come from the Middle East, and th like all the Byzantine uh, uh, churches— the ultimate default is Greek, but in fact, they use Arabic uh, quite a bit in their liturgy because they come from um, the Palestine, Israel, Syria, Lebanon. They're, they're scattered all through that region there. Uh, Jordan, a lot of them in Jordan. So, um, and I have, uh, we have a Melkite parish here, and I can check with Father Justin. I would say suggest this. A lot of the issues of some of the later cultures didn't affect them. You know, for instance, the Council of Trent was not an issue for them, but I've never heard anything by which they would reject Trent. It's just that the issues of justification by faith alone had not been part of their experience. Uh, it, it reminds me, too, uh, a lot of the—I've uh, never heard any of the Maronites either cite Trent. Uh, it, it's just something that doesn't figure into their mentality very much, but they don't reject it. Uh, you know, they were part of the—Maronites, uh, for instance, were— uh, had always been Catholic. They never separated and rejoined. They always remained Catholic. But Trent just wasn't an issue for them, and I don't even know if any of them came because there were wars between the Turks and the uh, and the Western Christian powers. Um, it's just uh, what I suspect is that it doesn't figure in to their thinking. But neither is it something they would say, oh, we don't accept that, we reject it. I, I, I can't believe that. Um, that. That wouldn't make any sense. So let me look a little bit more into it, and I'll, I suspect what I, what I just explained is going to be the case. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Let us now go over to Joey who is in Gregory, Michigan. Where is Gregory, Michigan? Oh, it's a small farm town, Father Mitch. I, I figured that, you. but where is it in Michigan? Uh, it's in between Howell and Pinckney. It's really an old, old farm town. Okay. Well, it's good to town. have you here with us from uh, Gregory. And what what is your question? My question is, Okay, so don't you think that the blessing that the, the Holy Father in his letter had said of, of homosexual couples would be inappropriate, especially in, in, the, in the way that the couple comes up? Aren't we 
um, responsible for our sins individually? Don't we meet God in heaven individually? Why wouldn't he just give a blessing to a person individually and instead of an outward form of the two homos- uh, homosexual men or women mm-hmm. and giving them a blessing when it's causing such scandal, which yeah. my parish condemns, and we're praying for the Holy Father to come uh, where we're saying a uh, rosaries for him, uh, uh, for his, for him to sure. come uh, back to the church and away from that. And uh, I just uh, wanted to say that, and I will shut the phone off so I can hear you on the radio. Okay. All right. Th- thank you very much. Um, here's, uh, I, I don't, I hear the word couple. Uh, being used uh, in this regard, but you know, you you cannot bless the actual making of a couple because, as the document says very clearly, um, that this is not marriage. It cannot be marriage. Marriage is only between a man and a woman for life, and open to having children. Um, and that's not these things. So I would, you know, my personal understanding is that it's a, a blessing such as I might give to uh, a person that comes up in the communion line, folds their arms across their chest to indicate that they cannot receive Holy Communion. And I give them a blessing. Um, and, you know, it's not, again, any kind of approval of whatever uh, situation or sin that may keep them from receiving community. I can't approve that. But I can pray for them, bless them. That's my soul. Under, that, that's the only way I understand this. It's the way that makes sense to me. Um, but I know that there are a, a number of bishops that just simply refuse to to do this, and they don't allow it in their dioceses. Um, this is a, a conflict, and I think it would be, uh, you know, I, I remember the line, Pope Francis used uh, early in his pontificate uh, where he said that we have to have the smell of the sheep on us. In other words, we have to be with the people enough to understand what's going on. Well, that means also having the uh, familiarity with people who make these objections because they don't want something inconsistent with our faith to be misunderstood. People don't want, you know, some sort of watering down of the faith. Uh, we can't do that. And we, we can't water down the meaning of marriage. Marriage is in enough of a crisis, so we certainly don't want to do that. And the document is very clear. It is not watering down marriage uh, or changing it to include something that is not marriage. It's explicit on that uh, and adamant. But there still is the possibility of misconstruing some of these actions. Are you saying that make you're making them a couple or recognizing their couplehood? Uh, I don't know what that even means. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense at the uh, 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 on the surface. So I can't you know give any kind of um, clarity on what they meant there, but um, I just assume, uh, that I'm blessing individuals so that they would come to seek the love of God and the mercy of God and not to prove bad behavior, but to seek his grace in order to do what is good behavior and holy behavior. Um, and, you know, for those who are not in marriage, it means 
chastity and, and celibacy. Um, they may need to pray for that grace. I'm happy to do that. Um, but I don't know what else that would mean. So that's as much as I can figure out. I guess it's still some confusion out there for sure. Let us now go over to Joseph, also in the Republic of Texas in San Antonio. Joseph, what can we do for you? Father, how are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Quick question, <clears throat> which um, I've always wondered. So at times before Mass, there's confessions. Good. Sometimes if there's a, lo- a line of three or four people, I, I try to get there at least, you know, 25 minutes before it ends. Mm-hmm. But you always get that one person, not always, but that takes a very long time in the confessional and the priest runs out of time and has to, you know, sometimes he has to start celebrating Mass and he sometimes says, I'll hear your confessions after Mass. I'm sure that's common. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who this has happened to. But my question is, Father, when he says that he'll hear your confession after Mass, depending on the state, you know, of your sin, must you wait until you actually have the confession? So the one priest said, well, you can still go to confession. I mean, still go to receive communion. Just make sure you go right after. And it's okay. So I don't know what the rule is or how. Mm-hmm. I've heard varying. Yeah. Uh, my own uh, understanding would be this. Um, if it's a mortal sin, uh, you need to go to confession first. And if it's a venial sin... Uh, then that would then uh, just go to confession afterwards, but go receive communion. But if it's something that is uh, a mortal sin, um, then uh, I would wait until after. And you know what I have done in those circumstances when somebody does come back to confession because they committed mortal sin, then I will give them holy communion right after their confession. That, you know, I'll, I'll go and uh, get, re, get the Blessed Sacrament from the tabernacle and then give them communion. I think that would, you know, again, um, it, it's not your fault or the priest's fault. All of a sudden, somebody's probably seeking spiritual direction uh, or may have a very, really serious situation that they have to address. Uh, and understand that it happens to me uh, in the, uh, other times. But I tell them, um, if it's mortal sin, wait and uh, come to me for confession right after Mass, and then after confession I'll give you communion. That's what I, that's been my practice for the last 48 years, so I would recommend that. Does that help? Sure. May I ask you one more quick question? Sure. If possible? Okay, so my daughter is in CCD, and they were talking about, Jesus is mercy. And um, in school, she had been wor- learning about wo- World War II mm-hmm. and, you know, in the Holocaust. And I mentioned that there was a commandant of the camp who was who was given absolution by a Jesuit, I think he was, Father uh, Father L-O-H-N Lone. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he was a Catholic, and he, he received communion. And my daughter was going coming at me, well, how is that? I'm just trying, is, can you give me any hints on how to tell a teenager about divine mercy on how how the Lord could forgive yeah. a man who was responsible for so much evil and yes. that he could possibly be in hell. I was struggling. I thought I was trying to be witty telling her this story, but I, I, I found myself. With a new problem. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to fatherhood. You explain one thing and you get into a new problem. Uh, but that, that is correct uh, about the, uh, the commandant. In fact, it was the commandant who had been over the Auschwitz camp uh, uh, when Maximilian Kolbe was condemned and died. And uh, in one of the books uh, on Kolbe, and the, 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 I forget the name of it, but it says it has commandant in the name, that, something like the, 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 the martyr and the commandant, something like that. Uh, and it tells that story. And the man repented. He he f- finally hit him afterward that he uh, d- and and he knew he was going to be hanged and he was hanged. And he himself wrote that uh, he deserved far worse than 
what he received because he had meted out far worse. But he, this is one of the realities uh, about uh, repentance. First, there is nothing, nothing he could do to make up for the sin he committed. Just as there's nothing any of us can do to make up for our sins, we don't have the ability to undo our sins. That applies to everything from stealing to disrespecting our parents to uh, abortion to murder to an atrocity like the concentration camp. Nothing we do can make up for our sins. We can't undo them. But, and this is where she needs to understand uh, of, about Christ. Jesus is God made flesh. And it is infinite God who dies on the cross. And that sacrifice on the cross therefore has infinite value. There, it, infinite, you have to help her understand. Infinite means there is no limit none and christ's death has a power that forgives any and every sin he forgives every sin ever committed in the in the world and in the history of the world that includes even many billions more crimes against humanity than happened at auschwitz but he has the power to forgive all of them if we repent. Now, does that mean that therefore he got off scot-free and just went up to heaven? I'm sure that there would have had to have been a purification of that man and his soul after he died. You know, there was uh, probably a lot of very, very wrong assumptions, uh, to say the least, in his life. He had to have those purified. He can't bring any of those into heaven. Nothing unclean can enter into heaven. Hatred of Jews, false ideas about Jews and gypsies and other people, all of these things cannot come to heaven. And he um, certainly needed a real uh, purification. Uh, so he might well have needed a lot of purgatory. I suspect that. Uh, leave it up to God but that he knew that he deserved great punishment. He accepted death and repented for what he did. Uh, he had been a seminarian, by the way, at an early stage of life, but lost his faith and you know, did what he did. Um, Christ, it's about how infinite Christ death, and that's what I would ask her to meditate on, not the injustice, but focus on the infinity of mercy. Reminder that we live in a society that clamors for justice but doesn't want to show mercy. This is typical for our society today. It's not unlike communist and socialist governments like the Nazis and the communists in the Soviet Union. So we need to help her to understand the infinite mercy of God that will deal out justice on a new level. Does that help? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father. Please You're... pray for me as I pray for you. Okay. Thank you. God God bless you. Raising teenagers, great work to do. Let us now go over to Robert in Saskatchewan. Robert, what can we do for you? Howdy, Father. God bless you. And I enjoyed your talk on uh, divine mercy and, and repentance and God's forgiveness. Well, I have a you. question. I hope, apologize that it's a little verbose, maybe, but I'm just trying to get a good commentary, or maybe you could tell me where I can get more reading on this. Is uh, Elijah and Enoch were both taken into up? The, the word translated is says into heaven. I don't mm -hmm. know if there's another way of translating that, but yeah. I'm just um, no. one, I'm trying to get an understanding of that. Would their bodies not have to change into a glorified form in order for that to happen? And how does that relate to the assumption of the Virgin Mary? Sure. Excuse me, I know who, <clears throat> sorry, who didn't have to die, but chose to die. 
out of love as an yeah. ex- uh, following her friend, son's example. So right, yeah, great, great question, Robert. Um, I had something similar yesterday. I think it's very important to uh, see that you know they died before, or they were assumed up. They're assumed into the heavens um, before Christ had opened the gates of heaven. And this is where some of the language is vague. In general, in the Old Testament, the language about life after death is very vague. They didn't like talking about it. They considered uh, concerns about life after death as an Egyptian thing. They... They didn't like to do that. Uh, the Egyptians did. The whole of Egyptian culture that they had come from was about life after death. That was more important. In fact, it even showed up in the architecture. Egyptians built their houses and cities out of mud brick. And as a result, with the centuries of Nile flooding, all, almost all of their houses and buildings are gone. But their temples were made out of stone because they were dedicated to death and preparing for life after death. And those are what we still see as monuments. Their houses, they didn't care about. They just let them melt in the water. Now, given that, when they talk about heaven, they often, for the most part, the reference to heaven in the Old Testament refers simply to the sky. They don't, as far as I know, I can't think of a term that means sky versus heaven. It's the same term. And they just refer to that. And they, they have a sense that they were taken up not into the heaven of paradise, where you have eternal life and you see God face to face. It's rather you just, they went in, you know, beyond the earth. That's all that they would be able to say that happened. Whereas when Christ dies and rises and opens the gates of heaven, then he would bring them with him into the paradise. Um, Whereas they had different ways of understanding life after death. They have a variety of terms. Bosom of Abraham is something used, for instance, in Luke 16. Uh, and I think in some of the literature um, about uh, 100s and uh, B.C. and the, the, the century before Christ. You also see Sheol as a place where you're shadowing. They never talked about the soul going to Sheol, that your shadow went there. Again, they had a vague sense of life after death. And so they don't define what happened to Elijah uh, or to uh, Enoch. Uh, they just have them disappear from the earth without passing through the suffering of death and uh which is also they also had first century bc document uh, called the ascension of moses saying that his body was also taken up but that's not in the bible it's in an extra biblical text so they had that sense but not that they went to paradise nor did they see god it they just didn't know where he went. Uh, but it also helps to explain why Moses and Elijah come to meet with Christ at the Transfiguration. But any more than that is just speculation. Does that help, Robert? Yes, uh, I just uh, would love a little bit on the assumption as well of Mary, but uh, well, uh, that's uh, fantastic, Father. Yeah, you might take a look at my book, uh, Mary, uh, Mother, Queen, uh, Virgin Mother and Queen. That I have a section on that that may be of help. All right, the Lord bless you all and keep you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.